Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter number three. Ezra chapter number three. We're going to look at a Thanksgiving passage here in the Old Testament. Ezra chapter number three. Ezra's right after the books of First and Second Chronicles. And we'll talk in just a moment about the background of where we are in this passage. But Ezra chapter three, I'd like to read just a few words here in verse number 11. Ezra 3.11 says, And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. Have you ever gotten the sense that your phone is spying on you? Have you ever had a conversation with friends or family? You were talking about a product or a service or maybe a destination, and then you open your phone and you log on to Facebook, and bam, there's an advertisement for that exact same thing that you were just talking about. Has that ever happened to you, or is that just me? Uh, our phones, and my phone in particular, sometimes makes it hard for me because it reminds me of all the things that I want. If you go and visit a store, online shopping, uh, you might look at a product, and then the next day, there it is on Instagram, and the next day, there it is in an email, and the next day, here it is on Facebook, and I'm constantly reminded, and and so are you, uh, of the things that we don't have, right? We're constantly reminded of the things that we want, and we log on, and even if it's not an advertisement, perhaps you, you look at some other family or another friend in another state who has something else, and we're always reminded of the things that we don't have. We have these built-in reminders in society of all the things we don't have, uh, but often we don't take time to remember the things that we do have. And Thanksgiving is one of these reminders where we can pause. It's a built-in uh, cultural reminder, so to speak, uh, to stop and to pause and to give thanks for, for what we do have. But even uh, Thanksgiving, this built-in reminder has become crowded uh, with things such as Black Friday and busy schedules. But it's important to stop and to pause and give thanks. UC Berkeley published a, uh, an article where they already recognized that uh, there is uh, mental health benefits to being a grateful person, but above and beyond that, they came out with another, uh, another article, there were more studies done, and last year they said there are actually even health benefits to being a grateful person. Gratitude can be an incredibly powerful and invigorating experience, uh, the author wrote. There is a, there's growing evidence that being grateful may not only bring good feelings, it could lead to better health. And so there are mental health benefits, and uh, there are physical health benefits to being grateful. But above and beyond that, we're going to look at some of the spiritual health benefits tonight of living a grateful life. One of the marks of a thriving Christian is gratitude. And conversely, one of the characteristics given to us in Romans chapter 1 of, uh, of a society that has moved far from God is unthankfulness. And so we are reminded throughout Scripture to give thanks. We should continually be giving thanks. And Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always for all things. Say say these words with me, always, repeat that word, always, and then all things. Say that together, all things. So what are we to be grateful for? And when are we to be grateful? We're to be grateful always and in all things. And then to whom are we to be grateful unto? To God. In the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to live in a constant state of gratitude, and yet we don't always. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he wrote his Thanksgiving Day Proclamation, October 3rd, 1863, said this, The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed, that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. So it's a good thing for us to do tonight to pause and to be thankful and to show gratitude for the things that God has given to us. And and to do that, I'd like to draw your attention to a group of believers who are practicing Thanksgiving. And there weren't any there weren't any turkeys there or anyone dressed up as pilgrims or no programs. But here's a group of believers here in the Old Testament that we read they are praising and giving thanks unto God. Now, how could they how had they experienced God's goodness and mercy? And here's where a little background is helpful. In the year 1605, Judah uh, came under siege by Babylon. And there were three different sieges that took place. And three different times, uh, the the Babylonian armies came in and they took captive the children of Israel three different times. There were three different exiles during this period. And on the third siege, the third wave of attacks, uh, Jerusalem falls and the temple is destroyed. The temple is burned to the ground. And this was a tragic loss for the children of Israel uh, to be held captive by the Babylonians. But the truth is that they were already held captive. 
You see, they were held captive to their sin, the sin of idolatry, the sin of rejection, rejecting God and disobedience. So they were already held captive. Now God's delivering them. This is, in fact, no surprise. God had even prophesied that this would happen. But now they find themselves in exile. And by the way, I love America, but similarly, America is the land of the free, but many live in bondage of sin every, each and every day. And so there's no more Israel for 70 years. The Jewish nation is in Israel. There's some 40 to 50,000 Jews living in exile. And we read of some of them in Scripture, some Zerubbabel and Daniel and others. Uh, there are other contemporaries at this time that we'll talk about later, Haggai and Zechariah. They lived during this time and during this time of exile. So there's no temple. And this is a big deal for the Jews because this is where they encountered the presence of God. This is where the presence of God was made manifest to them. This is where their worship centered at the temple. And so they have no temple. It's gone. It's destroyed. But something amazing happened some decades later. Babylon is overthrown and Cyrus becomes the king. And Cyrus was a good king, and he, he, he did something. Um, he, he, he let all the Jews go home. Uh, in fact, in the uh, London Museum, there's a stone. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. This is the decree that Cyrus had made. Uh, some call this the first human rights document ever inscribed. Well, what led Cyrus to release everyone to go to their home countries? Well, God did. Ezra chapter number one says, the Lord stirred the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And it goes on to say that he wanted Cyrus to release the people so they could build the house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. So, so we find this group of, of Jewish believers praising God. Well, why are they praising God? They're praising him because he's a good God and because he's a merciful God. And we see that manifested just by the fact that God let them return home to build the temple. And it was slow going at first. You can read of that. But now construction has begun. We read in verse number 10 of chapter number 3. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, they set the priests in their apparels with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of, king, uh, of David, uh, king of Israel. And they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks to the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. True thanksgiving is a heartfelt acknowledgement to God for who he is. And who is God? We find in this passage, he's two things specifically. First of all, God is good. God is always good. God was good before they were sent into exile and God was good while they were in exile. And God was good when he brought them back from exile. God was always good. And this was a moment of thanksgiving, acknowledging that God is always good. And while God's people had rejected him and forgotten him, God had not forgotten his people because he's a good God. Not only is he a good God, he's a merciful job, God. Uh, this was a second chance that was not deserved. They had not earned a good behavior that let them be released. This is, this is God acting in mercy to release them. And they recognized that. They received this mercy. So because of God's goodness and mercy, these people were delivered. And by the way, we give thanks for the same reason. The Bible says in Psalms 106 verse 1, Praise the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Oh, if you were just to walk out the streets and that's what you heard. Men praising the Lord. Instead of the bad news and the, 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 the political jabbing back and forth. If we would just walk out and just hear the goodness of God. Praise from the mouth of men. My, what a change that would be. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, and it, it continues to talk about how he has provided salvation to us by grace uh, through faith and not of works. And so just like the children of Israel, they were undeserving, but they experienced God's mercy. We too were undeserving. We've experienced God's mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. Now because of God's mercy and grace, these Jewish believers... In this passage, they experienced three things. And these three things that they had been given fueled their gratitude. I want to look at these three things very quickly. The three things that fueled their gratitude. The first thing that they had, they had a foundation. They had a foundation. 
We're speaking here of a physical foundation upon which the temple was going to be built. And this is the whole reason that they were released out of captivity. Cyrus released them so they would go and build the temple. It was slow going at first, but now construction has finally begun and the foundation has been laid. And all the people shouted with a great shout and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. Now here at Lancaster Baptist Church, we've had a lot of uh, different groundbreaking and ribbon cutting ceremonies. And I like every single one of them. Every one is an awesome experience and I've been to many of them. I prefer ribbon cuttings though. They're a little bit more exciting to me because, because uh, the building is complete. We had our bus barn, uh, the Eldon Lofgren bus facility and striving together facility. We did the ribbon cutting uh, just a month or so ago and that's exciting. Uh, here in this passage, we don't find necessarily a ribbon cutting. It's more of a groundbreaking, the foundation. But it's also exciting because you don't ever have a ribbon cutting unless you have a groundbreaking. Right. And that's what we're, we, we find this heartfelt gratitude. These believers, their, their sheer excitement and volume because the work of the Lord is beginning. And it wasn't done yet. But you can't have a ribbon cutting unless you have a groundbreaking. And they sense that God was doing something great in their midst. And by the way, we have a foundation too. And it's not a physical foundation made of stone. It is Jesus Christ is our foundation. It's the foundation of all that we believe. And I'm thankful for a school that teaches uh, Jesus Christ is the foundation. And upon that, we'll, we'll build everything out. But that's the solid foundation that we have as believers. Colossians 2 verse 6 says, As ye therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord. So walking in Him, rooted and built up. That's, that's the foundation. Uh, established in the faith as ye have been taught. And then what's the natural response? Abounding therein in thanksgiving. Amen. We ought to live in continual thanksgiving for the foundation that we have been given. The foundation found in Jesus Christ. So they had a foundation there. It, was, it wasn't the temple yet. Uh, we'll see in just a moment. It wasn't as big yet as the previous temple. But there was a foundation there. There was something to give thanks for. They had a foundation. Not only did they have a foundation in place, but they had fellowship. They had fellowship in God's people. And I know this is just a, a small segment of the verse, but in verse number 11 it says, and they sang together. And they sang together. They were together. There was a few things that they, that they had. They had a foundation, and they had each other. They had a group of believers who could gather together and worship together. Can you imagine what this group had been through? Can you imagine what they had seen? Can you imagine their journeys out of Jerusalem and, and um, watching the temple burn, so to speak, in the rearview mirror, and then seeing God work through Cyrus to, to, to let them go home? Can you imagine what they had been through together? And they had each other, and here they are in the moment, and they're singing, and they're singing loudly together. Again, as believers, we can be grateful for the fellowship that we have in Christ. Because of Jesus, because of the foundation, we have now a household of faith. We find expressions of gratitude written all throughout Paul's writing. In fact, in just about every letter you, you read, Paul expressing gratitude. Do you know what he most often is expressing gratitude for? Other believers. He's expressing gratitude for the fellowship that he has in Jesus Christ. In Philippians 1 verse 3 said, I thank God, my God, upon every remembrance of you for your, shell, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. In seven of the letters of the apostle Paul wrote, he said, I'm thankful to God for your faith. In five of the letters, he said, I'm thankful to God for your love. I'm thankful for God. In two of the letters, for your steadfastness. I'm thankful for the gifts that God has given to you in 1 Corinthians and Philippians. I'm thankful for your partnership in the gospel. To Timothy, I'm thankful for your mutual affection and friendship and the history that we've had serving along together. You know it's okay to tell each other we're thankful for each other. Amen. And we're thankful for your steadfast and your faithfulness and your love for Christ and the way that you're using the gifts for the Lord. And so they, they had each other. They had a, a foundation, which is Jesus Christ. But above and beyond that, they were there. They were worshiping together. They had fellowship. But something happens here that's a little bit weird. It's a little bit anticlimactic to this passage because things are going so well. It's, it says in verse number 12, But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, says that they wept with a loud voice and shouted, many shouted aloud for joy. So this is kind of peculiar what happens here in this moment. And this is repeated uh, three times in Ezra. It was also repeated in uh, Nehemiah, this anticlimax where the passage builds and then it kind of ends on a little bit of a sour note. That's what's happening here in this passage. Have you ever gotten someone a gift and you put some thought, time, and money into it and you gave the gift but then you 
didn't get the response that you were expecting? I think we've all been there before and just kind of awkwardly like, okay, I, I thought you would like it, you know? Here's a gift receipt, you know, you can take it back. That's kind of what's happening here. There was every reason to celebrate and yet some are crying, some are not. Uh, sometimes when my wife and I were in the living room of our house and we hear a commotion in the back room, we'll pause whatever we're doing and we'll listen and we'll look at each other and say, are, are they fighting or are they laughing? Are they crying? Any parents ever done that before? Where you're like, are they crying or are they laughing? Because sometimes you can't hardly tell the difference. And if they're laughing, you can leave them alone. If they're crying, you can leave them alone too, you know? But, you, uh, <laughs> but sometimes uh, you, you pause and like, hey, what's going on here? That's exactly what's happening in this passage because you read in the next verse, it says, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard far off. So, so miles away, they're hearing this loud commotion. Wait, are they happy? Are they sad? The answer is kind of a mixture of both. So here's what's happening. The Bible makes reference to the ancients. I looked it up in the Greek. That means an old person, right? So these are some of the people there, because this is about 50 years after the destruction of the temple. And so some of the people that have now come to return to see the foundation being laid are comparing it to the previous foundation. And, and, and it actually doesn't compare. They had the resources of David and Solomon to build the first temple. It was beautiful. It was big. It was amazing. You can read the day they dedicated that temple. And some of these people were there. And they see this foundation. And have you ever seen a house that was being built? Or sometimes even this happens on our property where the foundation will be laid for a building. I'll go look. And I'm like, oh, it looks kind of small. To me, the foundation always looks smaller than it actually is. Well, that's what's happening in this passage is that some of, the, some of the previous generation that had been there that had seen the glory of the former temple, they're looking at this and they, they just cry. They're not happy tears. They cry because it's like, this is not right. This is not what it's supposed to look like. Solomon's temple was built uh, with much higher quality materials. It was much bigger. So, so then the chapter ends. Isn't that kind of a strange ending to the chapter? It is, but isn't it also strange when God has been so good to us, but then something doesn't meet our expectations, and we fail to give thanks? We find an entire segment here that's failing to give thanks because, oh, it's not as big as I thought it would be or big as it should be, and they fail to give thanks. Now, before we judge uh, the people in this passage too highly, harshly, can we admit that there are times when the volume of our discontentment exceeds the volume of our praise. That's something the Lord convicted me of in this passage as I study. There are times where I know the volume of my discontent has exceeded the volume of my praise. And here's, here's a group of people. Are they, are they crying? Are they singing? Is he, is he giving praise to the Lord? Is he complaining? Is he this or is that? And it was a mud, muddied and mixed sound because it was both. Does the volume of your praise and of your gratitude outweigh every sentiment of your heart? We read that God is good and we know He's merciful, but rather live in all of these truths, we live sometimes as though we are entitled to them. This older, generation, this older generation here in this passage, they despise the inferiority of this new temple and they fail to respond in gratitude. They said, hey, this is smaller. And they were rebuked by it. Actually, Zechariah comes. You know the verse, the familiar verse, uh, for who hath despised the day of small things? He was referring to this exact instance of this temple foundation. Who has despised the day of small things? And, 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 and does the volume of your praise outweigh the volume of any other sentiment your flesh feels? Giving thanks always for all things unto the Lord God. So they had a foundation. They had fellowship. But there was one other thing that they had. And this fixes any unthankfulness, any discontent in our hearts. That what they had was they had a future. You see, the story was not done yet. God was not done with these people. This was just the foundation. There was more to come upon this. And one of the reasons we fail to give God thanks is that our perspective is wrong. It's one of the reasons we fail to give God thanks. Haggai chapter 2 uh, also speaks of this, and the prophet here, he, he uses this phrase later on in the passage in Haggai chapter 2. He says, from this day upward. I love that phrase, from this day upward. It's, it's, it's a shift in perspective. And then he instructs these people, these people who are crying, this mixed congregation, he instructs them and says, the glory of this latter house shall be greater 
No, well, I thought it was smaller. No, 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 it's actually going to be greater. Yeah, the footprint might be smaller, but the glory of what's going to happen here is going to be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. Why? And then he continues and says, and in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. You see that future, and the future was in a promise. They had a promise that they would be delivered from exile, and that promise has come to fruition. And by the way, we can look through Scripture, and we can see promise after promise after promise that has been fulfilled. But yet they had future promises as well. And then the future promise was that there's going to be something greater here. The temple, would it be larger? Would it be more extravagant than Solomon's? No, no, it's even better than that. The Bible tells us, for God, who commanded the light out of darkness, has shined in the heart of men to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There was going to be someone better there that would walk on this foundation, and that was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter number 12, but I say unto you that in this place, standing on that very foundation, he says, in, in this place, one greater than the temple, speaking of himself, Jesus. What are we to give thanks in? Everything. Amen. Always. How could believers praise God then in trials and difficulties and loneliness? Because the story is not over yet. Amen. And God is still good. And I know in a church family, even in the course of a year, there have, there have been many uh, difficulties and tragedies and loss and difficult circumstances. Are we excluded from giving God praise in those instances? No. We give God praise, but we understand that the story is not over yet. In the book of Job, chapter number 19, we read, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand in that latter day. Job says, I know how the story ends. I saw this article just recently. Uh, it was uh, published by Grammarly, and maybe you've gotten an advertise it for Grammarly. And Grammarly comes with these quick tips and assist on writing uh, better sentence structure and things like that. And uh, there's an article on the phrase, thank you in advance. And the article advised you not to use uh, the words thank you in advance on the end of an email. Uh, depending on the tone of the email, it could be read wrong. Uh, there's the assumption there, thank you for what I'm assuming you're about to do. There can be a little bit of an assumption there. Uh, uh, the article said, thanks in advance can put the recipient in the awkward position of having to say no after that you implied that you expected a yes. Thanking them for something that's actually not even done yet. Do you know as believers, we give thanks in advance. Not for something that we're expecting God to do, but for something that he has already done for us. And the implications of that and how that unfolds, it's already done. The devil is already defeated. The victory has already been given to us. We can say thanks in advance, not because we're hoping that God does something for us, but because he has already done something for us. So we too can give thanks to God for the foundation that he's given us in Jesus Christ, the foundation that's in place, the fellowship in God's, uh, uh, with God's people, and then the future that we have in the promises of God. Let's